Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are on this planet, and welcome to our City Life. So today we are going to have a City Life on a very special topic, since we are going to talk about water on the moon and the recent discovery made by with the SOFIA um, Observatory. So to talk about this, I invited the uh, three renowned famous uh, SET Institute researcher. So we have Coral Clark. Hi, Coral. How are you? Hi, Frank. I'm doing well. How are you? I'm good. So Coral is a AAA co-manager. I don't should not say AAA. AAA co-manager. And she's going to tell us a bit what is the AAA program in a, in a few minutes. We have Dana Backman. Hi, Dana. Hello. So Dana is AAA principal investigator. And then we have Pascal Lee. Uh, hello, Pascal. Hello. Hi, hi everybody. How hi. are you? Pascal, you're not on the moon, right? You are. Uh, no, I'm not. Uh, uh, this is the background is actually Clavius Base from okay. the movie 2001: A Space Odyssey. I'll talk about that later. We're gonna talk about that. So, Cla uh, <laughs> Pascal is a planetary uh, uh, planetary astronomer, uh, planetary scientist at the SET Institute as well. So. Yeah, let's go straight to the topic and uh, let, briefly talk about this uh, interesting discovery that was announced uh, last week, if I remember, on the discovery of uh, water. So let's just water on the moon. I mean, I'm not a very specialist of, of the moon, but I know that we have seen water on the moon before. We have detected water on the moon. So one of you, please tell us in, a sh in short why this discovery is different to the previous detection of water announced in the past. Uh, well, I, I can take this. Pascal, on, should, we yeah. should also really discuss how we got to this finding. But uh, yes, we knew that there was water on the moon in the polar regions. Uh, in other words, in the polar regions, we have detected H2O. We, we know that there is water ice in the polar regions of the moon. Uh, what we have detected this time uh, in fact, we, I had nothing to do with the research myself, but the, what the team has announced this time uh, is the detection of, the certain detection of water on the sunlit face of the moon. Because where water was found in the polar regions before was either in the permanently shadowed craters of the moon or presumably underneath the surface of the moon uh, within the top meter or so of the regolith of, of the moon of the soil of the moon in the polar regions. But here we're talking about water that is in the form of H2O, the common form that the, the, the water that we, we you know, could potentially drink and use. That again, we knew exists in the polar regions, but it's, it's found this time now in the, on the sunlit side of the moon in the, at the very surface of the moon, not buried at a depth of one meter or so. Okay. Uh, so that's, that's the remarkable finding. So, um, and that's the question for Dana and Coral. You, um, so we found water on the moon, okay? But how do we find water on the moon? How, what, was, what kind of instrument was used to do this, uh, this remarkable discovery? Dana, you are mute. Damn, I am no longer a mutant, yes. Okay. Uh, Coral and I were on that flight. Uh, we were not part of the scientific team, but we were uh, bringing a, a team of educators, uh, high school science teachers mostly, uh, at that, which is what we do uh, in the AAA program. But we were, uh, the point of, of our program uh, is to get the teachers uh, to witness how the scientific process works, how uh, ast astronomical observations are conducted. And this was so Sophia is a modified 747 uh, aircraft that was bought by NASA. It had been a commercial airliner. Uh, it was modified to carry a 17 ton, two and a half meter diameter telescope uh, in a compartment behind the wings uh, and uh, with a roll back door. Uh, and those of us on the plane are in a shirt sleeve environment uh, forward of a bulkhead. Uh, the telescope's behind that bulkhead, but the instrument uh, that was used to make these measurements is the forecast camera F O R C A S T? It was built at Cornell University and has been one of the workhorse instruments for Sophia. And in this case, it had what's called a grism, a grating prism, inserted in front of the camera. So it was taking 
spectral images of of the pieces of the moon that were being studied. So so uh, it's fundamentally a camera, but it was turned into a spectrograph for these observations. And Sophia operates by ca by uh, carrying the telescope and the instruments above the Earth's water vapor uh, layer and uh, the. Uh, the the wavelengths at which these observations were made, 6.1 microns wavelength or, or 6,100 nanometers, if you think in nanometers, um, it, you, it cannot be observed even from high mountaintops on the Earth. The Earth's atmosphere blocks uh, uh, wave, radiation of that wavelength. But at Sophia's operating altitude of uh, 13 kilometers, 40,000 to 45,000 feet, uh, that you, you can observe celestial sources at this wavelength, 6.1 microns, and, uh, and that was why Sophia was able to do this observation. No other observatory uh, uh, on the uh, no observatory on the ground could have made this observation. So now, uh, uh, Coral, if, uh, if, if you'd like to tell people what we were doing bringing the teachers about our AAA program, um, how they, they lucked out to be on this particular flight, um, um, sure. We, we actually have uh, anywhere between 25 and 30 uh, teachers who are selected in a competitive process to be trained on infrared astronomy and then have an immersive uh, experience uh, in Palmdale in Southern California, including at least one flight aboard Sophia, which is an all night flight, eight to 10 hours long. On um, this particular flight, because we assign teachers according to their location and their availability, and we don't know what we're gonna be looking at. In any given night, we look at anywhere between five and 12 objects. And we had at this particular night scheduled to have four teachers um, from Southern California and Las Vegas, two district representatives um, from California and Texas, and then three uh, planetarium professionals from Colorado, Fisk Planetarium in Colorado. And they so they represented four states and they were absolutely over the moon to be selected to be on this flight. Um, and we're up all night until the, uh, the 12th leg, which is one of the last legs, is the last parts of the Sophia mission that uh, the moon got 32 minutes scheduled. And, uh, so 32 minutes of observation, mm -hmm. which led to the, to the discovery that was published in Nature Astronomy. I don't know if we have it, but I have the figure here. I don't know if you can see that on my iPad. That's basically the result of this observation. Frank, do you, I have that on a slide. Do you want me to share that? Yeah, show us, please. So as Carl was just saying, while she's getting that prepared, there were uh, a dozen different objects studied by Sophia. That flight was not dedicated just to lunar observations. There were asteroids. There was an X-ray binary. Uh, there was uh, uh, red supergiants uh, and so on. And the moon was just scheduled as one of the one of the half, uh, 10 or so objects that were studied. And it was towards the end of the flight when these observations were made. Are you and guys seeing that? Yes, we see yes, you, uh, yes. you fantastic, exciting spectra. <laughs> this is from, this is the observers, right? This is, this is the researchers' findings, not, yeah, from Nature Magazine, yeah. Yeah. So what's so maybe um, do you want to explain Pascal what we are seeing or you want me to just well, so I mean just to just to summarize and you, we don't even need to look at the plots here for this but it's important to understand that what we knew before this this discovery what we knew before was that there was water on the sunlit side of face of the moon but we weren't sure what kind of water there's a water that's familiar to us you know that we use for drinking all all the time which is H two O the entire water molecule. But then the other possibility of what was being detected before, which was observations made at three microns of wavelength, the, the, the other possibility for the observation of water at three microns was that it, it was in the form of OH, not H2O, but just OH. In other words, water that is somehow really an intimate part of the minerals at the surface of the moon. And so until we, we could tell the two apart, we weren't sure that we were dealing with H2O uh, in the form that you know we'd like to to be able to to just collect and, and consume. Uh, so what this discovery made by by uh, Sophia and this this uh, test that we actually did is to confirm that it actually is in the form of H two O. At least part of it is in the form of H two O. 
Uh, and that is because they did their observation at six microns of wavelength, not three microns. And once you're at six microns, you get a, an absorption, basically, um, actually an emission, you, you will be, uh, you can confirm that it's water that you're looking at, H2O uh, form of water that you're looking at. And that's, that's the remarkable discovery. There is H2O, essentially, at the very surface of the moon, although probably sheltered in some way, because otherwise it would, it would tend to just uh, dissipate. Yeah. We're going to go through, through this conversation because I think that's an important point. But before we, we continue this conversation, I would like to remind our viewers that they can send us questions. Of course, we're going to take the time to answer to them. And uh, in fact, we have people from everywhere in the world, from Norway, Liverpool, uh, British Columbia and Canada, Berlin, the Niagara Falls, John Falls, Los Angeles, Iowa, Tunis, uh, Macquarie University, hey, and uh, Oklahoma, Sydney, Alabama, and weapon in and of course and also uh, someplace in Missouri called Warrensburg. So thank you for joining us. Oh, I forgot there is more from Russia, from Illinois, and from Kansas City. So thank you for joining us, and please uh, take the time to send us your questions. We are going to to take uh, to answer to a few of them in the in the next minute. Um, so yeah, let's go back to this. What what Coral you're showing us here? It's basically the um, a picture of the moon. So they, with this instrument, the forecast instrument, they did not observe the entire moon. They observed a small part of the moon. Can you tell us which part they've been focusing on and why? Well, that's, that's Clavius Crater there. So um, um, it's an interesting crater because it's a crater that you can see uh, if you look at the moon from Earth. I mean, it's on the yes. side, the side of uh, that, of course. And it's a crater in the southern, southern pole of, of the moon. So why did they choose to look for water in this area specifically? They made a comparison of a high latitude zone, uh, Clavius, with a low latitude zone, uh, the Sea of Serenity, Mare Serenitatis, which was where some of the Apollo landings had been. And they got a negative signal from the low latitude zone. And... Uh, 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 a positive, very positive signal from the higher latitude zone. And I think that they didn't know what to expect ahead of time. They, they were just comparing the high to the, to the low latitude zone. And it, the, the, the signal was strong for, the, uh, for water in the higher latitude, but not the polar, not really polar, but, but medium high latitudes. Mm -hmm. But in the region where the Apollo landings were, there was no detection of water. And that's a question maybe that was on some people's minds. Did, didn't the Apollo samples that come back have water in them? Well, uh, this, this, uh, uh, this uh, research showed a negligible signal in the zone where the Apollo landings had been. Now, uh, you bring up, right, you stop sharing. Go ahead, sir. Yes. Uh, sorry, I was going to say, Dana, you bring up a really good point here because uh, Clavis is, is at a latitude of about 58 degrees south. Okay, so it's not really the polar regions, but it's much higher in latitude than all the Apollo landing sites, which, which were, you know, roughly near the equator. Um, the couple of exceptions that was, you know, that were a little uh, slightly higher in latitude. But uh, the, the key thing here is that uh, we're talking about the detection at six microns of, of free water, H2O, which, which somehow is very volatile. It, it, would, it would not stay stable at the lunar surface exposed to sunlight and radiation and micrometeor bombardment unless it was somehow uh, sheltered. And so the, the, the discovery, first of all, uh, tells you that indeed in the Apollo areas where we landed, we, we did not bring back samples which had free H2O in them. And sure enough, we don't detect that with SOFIA. But it's also suggesting that had we collected samples or visited places that were somewhat higher in latitude, not even polar, but just up to 58 degrees south, for example, where Clavius is, uh, and if we had the right sampling process at the time, we might have actually brought back some of that lunar free water that's, that's being detected now. Uh, so, so, and we can talk more about the implications later. It's still a very small amount. So that's actually a testimony to the to the incredible sensitivity of the SOFIA uh, instrument as well and, and the, the capability of the system. I'm blown away by what it could detect, actually. Yeah, the, I want the to depth, clarify the, that I say right. thousand pole, but I, want, I wanted to say thousand limb of the yeah. moon, not yeah. the pole. 
Go ahead. And, and these these measurements would only be in uh, regards to uh, water uh, molecules within a few millimeters. Uh, I mean, this is not a, a, a deep measurement of the lunar soil. It's just the very surface soil that that this detection is from. Yeah. And and so the 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 authors of the paper offer two possibilities, which I find both you know reasonable and and good of them to have to to be considering. One is that you are dealing with H2O that is sheltered in a, in a way that it's locked up actually in glassy beads at the surface of the moon. And we find these glassy beads all over the moon. Uh, they are mostly generated by impact processes. Impact melting uh, creates agglutinates and glassy beads that can then trap water. And once your water molecule is trapped inside, well then it can be exposed to the lunar surface environment. It, it won't escape and you can therefore detect it. Or it's water actually that is hiding uh, and being sheltered in the nooks and crannies of the soil of the moon. And that is also a very intriguing possibility. And the fact that we, we don't detect the water at lower latitudes, but at higher latitudes, like here, 58 south, and, and we know, of course, at, at higher latitudes still, suggests that it could actually be just water that's hiding freely, uh, at least in part hiding freely in the, in the interstices between the, the lunar grains. So it's right there at the surface, uh, just just somehow sheltered maybe in the shadows of, of the grains. So there is this this uh, discovery got a, some a lot of press, of course, because uh, because it's water and because it's a moon. So maybe one of you could talk about the importance of this discovery in the framework of the Artemis program of NASA. Coral, maybe or Dana. So. The. Uh... The, the, the people in the press conference that was, pre the press conference was offered jointly by the science division of NASA and the human exploration division. So the people planning the Artemis uh, 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 program and the return to the moon were extremely interested in uh, and being, you know, having this be part of their publicity and uh, people were asking them over and over again, but does this mean you're gonna put the lunar base where the water was measured, and they were they hedged. They wouldn't they wouldn't say that directly. But what this meant was that that there's a feasibility of being able to harvest the water and not have to carry all that water to the moon uh, in, in, for a, a base. And uh, uh, because the amount is 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 small, but it's not negligible. Uh, the 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 Casey Hannibal, the uh, the print, the uh, first author. I think she said a 10 ounce bottle of water per cubic meter of soil. And that strikes me as like, yeah, it, I, you, that you could mine that and, and uh, you know, uh, support the base. But that was the NASA's presentation was this clearly is, is useful, important information for the return to the moon, but they wouldn't go right and say, now we know we're going to put where the, where the first landing is going to be. They wouldn't, they wouldn't say that right out. So we this discovery is in, is interesting because it's discovery of water, but it's only on the surface, right? You mentioned that Dana is just like a few millimeter above the in the surface. So maybe there is more water underneath. We don't know. Have we dig um, deep enough in the in the soul of the moon to be able to detect water? Is there a mission to do that? I can, I can try to answer that. So first of all, on Apollo, of course, we we return core samples, but that's that's not in these samples that we've been finding uh, any free water locked up. And again, they were low latitude sites. Uh, here, it would be really intriguing. I think that would be the next question. If we landed at Clavius and dug deeper, would we find more water? Uh, in the polar regions, we actually have excavated the polar regions. NASA Ames uh, had a very spectacular ex experiment uh, called L-Cross, where we created an artificial impact on the moon by crashing uh, a spacecraft uh, in, into the moon. And right, coming in right behind that spacecraft was another spacecraft analyzing the ejecta plume that was uh, created from the, from the impact of the first spacecraft just before the second spacecraft itself crashed as well. But, and all of this, of course, are intentional crashes. Uh, and what was revealed was that, you know, you, you actually have quite a bit of water ice locked up in the polar regions of the moon. And just to put things in perspective, in the polar regions of the moon, you have approximately 
you know, for every gram of soil, you have about 50 milligrams or somewhat up to 50 milligrams or so of water uh, in the lunar soil. For every gram, you have about 50 milligrams of water. So less than 0.5%, sorry, less than 5% by mass, less than 5% by mass. But here, here we're talking about something that is about a hundred times less, okay, than the concentration that we are dealing with in the polar regions of the moon. So I'm not surprised that NASA didn't sort of, I mean, any discovery of water is important for science, but also in the context of human exploration, because water can be used as a solvent, as for drinking, as a rocket fuel, if you break it down into hydrogen and oxygen. So we're all familiar with that. Any discovery of water is worthy of, of an announcement on the moon. But uh, in a general sense, water is important for human exploration. It's not clear at all that what we found here at Clavius will have any uh, real ex exploitability, given that we're talking about an amount that is 100 times less than what's in the polar regions uh, or more. In other words, even less than that. Uh, so, uh, but nevertheless, it's very intriguing. And again, as you point out, Frank and everybody, this just pertains to the top uh, surface of the moon, and we don't know what might might uh, might what the under, underground might hold. So we are uh, getting questions from uh, the, our viewers. So thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a few questions that I got before in fact this, this uh, from a colleague of mine who asked me why we had to wait so many years to get this such a discovery with the Sofia aircraft. This Sofia has been um, and forecast has been available for years. So. Any of you know why we had to wait on 2020 to, uh, to get this detection? I know. So, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, uh, so, Sophia operates uh, like other large observatories on the basis of peer reviewed uh, uh, observing proposals and no, no scientist had proposed to make this observation until last year. Uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't Go ahead. Yes. There, there might have been kind of talk in the astrophysical community that um, the Sophia as, uh, as an observatory, because the moon is so bright and the moon, as you saw, it took almost up all of the monitors. They need to fix the telescope on stars. Uh, the moon was too big to, to fix the telescope and guide on. Mm -hmm. So they weren't even sure that they, they, they really were unsure and thought that they weren't going to be able to, um, to keep the moon in, in the target and get uh, reasonable data. This was, this was a technically challenging observation for Sophia, but the, the, the people who proposed it, um, the, the director of the observatory was so impressed with the proposal that they got uh, director's discretionary time, which is a pri uh, sort of a private stash of time that the director has to give to meritorious proposals that are not getting time otherwise or uh, and so on. So this was sort of a pilot program. They plan to go back and measure other p places on, on the moon, but these 32 minutes were sort of a uh, a boon from the d observatory director because it was such an, an, uh, an impressively interesting, uh, potentially exciting uh, observation to make. So uh, nobody had nobody had asked to do this, and and it, it was a little hard to do. So yes, answer to my second question. So thank you. Okay, so another question we have from uh, people um, uh, well watching us right now. So do we have any trace of atmosphere on the moon because of the presence of water? Uh, well, we, there is an atmosphere on the moon. It's a very tenuous atmosphere. Uh, it's called, actually, it's called an exosphere because a lot of it is escaping. And the fact that we even have an atmosphere on the moon is, is in part because it is continually being created. And it's continually being created by the mostly the interaction between the solar wind, which is a stream of charged particles, protons mainly streaming in from the sun, uh, which then uh, hits the surface of the moon, releases molecules that that then bounce around at the surface of the moon. So this this haze, if you will, of molecules and atoms that are bouncing and charged particles that are bouncing around at the surface of the moon is called the exosphere of the moon. That's that's the atmosphere of the moon. Now, water was, again, had been detected in the form of hydrogen bouncing around before, 
Uh, but we didn't know that, it, you know, that H2O as a free molecule was available at the surface of the moon on the sunlit side yet. And that's what Sophia uh, discovered. Yeah, um, I, I, re okay, go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Uh, I remember reading a statistic that I didn't go check. Um, uh, so uh, take, take this maybe with a grain of salt, but the, uh, the moon's atmosphere is so uh, tenuous that one lunar landing, all the exhaust from one lunar landing, would doubles the density of the moon's atmosphere temporarily. That's that that's uh, it's, it's only equal to the exhaust from one Apollo landing. So the question I got also from one of our viewers: What is this tiny spike that we we show on on the on the on coral slide? What exactly is this emission? What is it is due to? Is that I let you? Okay. Well, it at three. So think of the water molecule as a Mickey Mouse head. You know, it's H two O. So the ears of Mickey Mouse are the hydrogen atoms, and the O, the head itself, is the oxygen atom. So every water molecule that we drink and floats around in the atmosphere of the Earth in clouds is is a Mickey Mouse head, and when the connection between the O, the head, and the one of the ears, the H, vibrates. And every OH vibration essentially absorbs energy at three microns. So we knew that detection of three micron absorption before, before Sophia. But, but all we knew was that it was an OH vibration. So we couldn't tell if it was due to a full water molecule or whether it was due to OH locked up in minerals in, in the lunar rocks. What we see now at six micron, the six micron uh, spike that you see, the six micron emission that you see is due to the entire water molecule, the two Mickey Mouse ears and the oxygen item vibrating as a whole in some sense. So, so that is a clear signature of H2O and not of just OH, which was ambiguous of H2O. And so that is what that is what is such a remarkable thing. And it's very difficult to make this observation from from the surface of the Earth, of course, because we have all the atmosphere of the Earth to go to go through. There's plenty of water in the Earth's atmosphere. So it's it's essentially impossible to detect water on the moon if you're just looking from the ground on the Earth, which is why Sophia is such a remarkable uh, research tool is because it's a stratospheric. That's what the S stands for. It's a stratospheric observer. It takes you above the bulk of the Earth's atmosphere, above, above the bulk of the, the water in the Earth's atmosphere. And now all of a sudden, you are able to, to see water that's actually on other worlds, not just on our own. Thank you for the chemistry class. I wish I had you as a chemistry teacher when I was. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking the same <laughs> I will, thing. <laughs> I will remember this for the rest of my life. <laughs> the Mickey, Mickey here is perfect. Thank you. Um, so another question is that, um, oh, some of the more advanced questions about water and extraction of water. Um, do we have the technology to extract this water at the moment? for a lunar moon, lunar, uh, moon uh, lunar base, sorry. Can, can I say I, we need to know more yeah. about what exactly the water is? Is it encased in spheres? Is it, so we need to know that before we take the next step, but. Mm -hmm. if, if, it, if it is water that's uh, sheltered by grains and not in little glass spheres, then uh, I, it seems to me, although I could be wrong, uh, that you could extract the water by taking a, a big scoops of the soil and, and bringing them into some place that uh, heat, heats up the soil and drives off the water as water vapor, and then you collect the water vapor. Uh, I, I could be wrong. I'm kind of making that up. But, but, but heating the soil to drive off the water would be how I would go if you, if you uh, asked me to do it right now. But these are these are really these are good points. Uh, I would I would just want to add that uh, we've been attending lately a lot of workshops uh, that NASA is organizing to get us ready for the Artemis missions to the lunar polar regions. And you know one of the things that uh, some teammates uh, of mine and myself have brought up, and in, this is actually a study led by an intern, uh, Monty Rosenthal. Uh, we've been bringing up the fact that a spacesuit itself releases about half a kilo of water per hour. Okay, think about that. Half wow. a 
also of water is released by a spacesuit per hour through purposeful venting, but also just overall leakage. Now, that amount is equivalent, actually, to the abundance of water that we know is in the polar region in one square meter around you within the top centimeter, okay? The top centimeter holds something like half a kilo of water within per square meter in the polar regions. Uh, and that is what you release with your spacesuit in about an hour. Now, the amount that was detected here at Clavius is, once again, it's a hundred times less than that. So, for example, going in there with humans and scooping this up and you know, bagging it quickly uh, is, is going to be fraught with experimental uh, error because we might be simply bringing back soil that's contaminated by our own backpacks release. So we're going to have to come up with a way to study this water at the lunar surface without, you sort of, it's sort of the equivalent of the Heisenberg principle in geology where you want to study something, but you don't want to disturb it. <laughs> And it's very difficult to, to disturb, to not disturb something as delicate as free water hiding in the nooks and crannies of grains, uh, you know, to, to, to study it. Thank you. So we have a last question, which is related more to the flight. So when you did the observe, when you were the, in the flight, uh, could you tell us the trajectory that you fly above? People are always curious to know if you go to Hawaii or if you just go to the, to one New York. And, uh, and after the flight or during the flight, did you know about this measurement and the success of this measurement already? Um, the uh, the Sophia's trajectory is determined only by the objects it's studying because the telescope is pointed by turning the plane. So the telescope only looks out the left side of the plane. And so on a given flight, we zigzag all over the Eastern Pacific and the Western US, uh, each zig or zag is a different object that's being studied, a galaxy or a star or the moon or whatever. And I can't remember our flight trajectory on that particular one, but a typical trajectory would be, you know, flying from the base in, in Southern California as far east as, you know, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin to the Northeast and then back to Palmdale at the end of the night with a set of objects scheduled so that you end up home before you run out of gas and that kind of thing. So uh, I can't remember what our trajectory on that particular flight was, but they're they're all over all over the northern hemisphere basically, uh, and uh, and they did not know that they had had a, a strong water detection uh, at the time. They had to reduce their data back at home at the University of Hawaii. The, the group was, was actually from there. Uh, uh, they knew that they had done the best they could. They knew that they were pointing where they wanted to be pointing and that they had lots and lots of good measurements and, and minutes pointed at the moon, but I don't, uh, they, did not, they did not see the spectral result uh, uh, at the time. It was later. Yeah, thank you. I flew on, on Sofia and we went to Hawaii yeah, and never landed and come back. <laughs> that was my frustration. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, we get, uh, you know, we fly 10 hours and, and land where we start. So frequent flyer miles are by zero <laughs> taken from one to the other. So we get zero frequent flyer miles for that. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much to the three of you. Um, any final thoughts you want to share with us about maybe the future of SOFIA, the future of the AAA program, and maybe some of the work you're doing on other moons? I give you like two minutes each. <laughs> uh, I'll start. I'll start. Uh, you know, behind me, what you see again is uh, Clavius Base, which is course uh, a base that was imagined in the movie uh, in 2001 of Space Odyssey, Stanley Kubrick's movie with Arthur C. Clarke. And uh, Clavius was picked because it was a high latitude crater from which you could still see the earth above the horizon very well. And this is why it, it's sort of so spectacular. And most places where we landed on the moon with Apollo, the earth was all, almost overhead because we were near the equator of the moon. Uh, so at, at high latitude, you see the earth on the horizon. But I think that we live in a great age here where we are in the process of down selecting where we might land and set up a, a base camp on the moon in the next uh, few years. And it's uh, these, all these discoveries are helping us make the right choice. What about you, Dana? 
I'm going to interject. Uh, I went and found the flight plan map for the lunar observation, and the lunar uh, 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 measurements were made while Sophia went from Southern California right up the Central Valley almost to Oregon and then turned around to come home. So uh, it happened to be we were over the continent and over California, but that's just happenstance. That's the scheduling artifact. Uh, so I'll defer to Coral to talk about what we want to do with the AAA. Well, I'm just really thrilled that uh, this this finding solidified or, or um, made Sophia in the, in the headlines a little bit more because they um, Sophia has been doing great research since 2010 when she started flying. We've been lucky enough to bring up 20 very select, uh, amazing educators during that time, and uh, we're looking for our current group. Uh, to have to finish their 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 flights their flight weeks and bring back their knowledge to their students and their communities and their schools and looking to continue that the amazing partnerships we have with districts across the country it, it really binds the nation together and binds teachers to their communities into the future with their students so it, it's it's a it's a great use of of resources and we're really thrilled and proud to be part of the program yeah, I would say that one of the great, the great success of the, of Sofia that it's a facility which managed to put great science with very great education and outreach. And I think this is important, especially in the time now where people are still want. Uh, some people still wonder what we can do with science. This is a great example of uh, a way to show the the excitement of science and the beauty of discoveries like this one that will change the world. Maybe not tomorrow, but in the future. Now we know there is water on the moon almost everywhere. That will change probably the way we envision the exploration of our, our own moon. So I would like to thank you, the three of you, for participating to our city live and uh, also our viewers, wherever you are on this planet. I hope you like uh, these conversations. Remember this conversation. Remember that we do that every week, twice, once, twice, sometimes three times when we are, we are full of uh, ideas and topics. Uh, the SETI Institute is a nonprofit organization, and uh, SETI Live is part of our art outreach, and we do that at no cost. So if you want to participate, be involved, the first thing you could do is to click here or here to basically. Uh, uh, join our YouTube page. Uh, you can also visit our website. You can also be part of our social media. And of course, if you want to make a donation, don't forget to click on the button on the top right on our website, click donate and uh, be part of the story, be part of the science and space exploration. Thank you very much again and uh, see you maybe next week to talk about something new, something fun and something 